Hey everyone. This time on Video Game Book Club, we read Breakout, How Atari 8-Bit Computers Defined a Generation. This is by Jamie Landino. This is the second book that I think he's done. The first one we did was Adventure. Um, this has a few of the same problems that Adventure had as well, but we're just going to look at this one as a, on a standalone. And I, I did my best to kind of not compare the two books, but it was hard at some times. So this book looks mostly at Atari's computer line. It was something I didn't really know too much about. I know they did home consoles and they did arcade machines and we read books kind of on those those uh, earlier and they've been sprinkled throughout whenever we've read like a history book about video games. But this one was kind of touched upon in an art book review and it's a really interesting thing. Uh, I actually Fun fact, I actually own an Atari 8-bit 8 8 computer. I have the Atari 400, and I also have the tape drive. They actually came with an audio cassette drive, and they would put games on these little audio cassettes, which were pretty cool at the time. I mean, uh, now it's sort of weird looking at that uh, type of format. Uh, if you guys want, I can show you that later or something like that. Just let me know in the comments below if you want to see like a quick video on the Atari computers and whatnot. Anyway, getting past all of that, Jamie did a really good job of basically explaining what the Atari 8-bit computers were, sort of going over the problems with the original two, the 400 and the 800. The 400 has, it's a weird looking computer, especially if you compare it to today's. Uh, back then, they would basically have a keyboard, and then they would jam all the computer parts underneath the keyboard and also, like, kind of behind it, so it would all come in, like, one dedicated box. And then it was kind of up to you to figure out how you wanted to do the monitor. You could buy your own monitor, or you could actually hook it up to your television as well. Kind of a weird way to do things. It, it looked a little funky, especially for me when I looked at that and I'd never really seen one before and I was like, oh my god, how does this thing even work? It looks a lot more like the, um, like the, uh, computers you'd see in the United Kingdom, like the, uh, ZX Spectrum or the BBC Micro or the Acorn or, uh, I don't want to say Electron so I'm not really too familiar with that. But if you haven't seen, like, any of the UK computers, definitely check those out, and you'll get a pretty good idea of what, like, the Atari 800 will, 8, 400 and 800 look like. They're just a lot bigger than those. <laughs> anyway, now that I've gone off on a crazy tangent about that, Jamie really does do a great job with this book, sort of explaining uh, the different problems with Atari and their computer line, where they weren't really sure if the computer was supposed to be like a successor to the 2600 or if it was supposed to be like its own thing, like a business computer or something like that. The 400 was not really positioned very well. It, um, it, it was more powerful than the 2600, I'll give it that, but they never really seemed to commit with what they wanted to do. Because the big thing with computers and also with uh, game consoles was getting uh, software on it. If you don't have the games, if you don't have programs, then your computer or your home console is just kind of useless. Back in the 70s, you could get away with having a dedicated console where it was like, okay, we just have a video game console and we're just going to make third-party games for it. The only thing is that your third-party game set, sorry, now that I've messed all that one up, uh, you have to have first-party games for it. If you look at Nintendo, they've got a line of great first-party games. They could probably keep making consoles forever as long as they have that string of first-party games. You have Microsoft, they've got some pretty solid first-party games as well. You have Sony, they can pretty much buy anybody's title to like go underneath their uh, little publishing arm that they have. And back in the 70s and 80s, you had Atari that would pretty much pump out their own first-party games, and they were they were uh, really head and shoulders above the competition for a while. Uh, slowly, the third parties, as they sort of came into being and actually got really good, they started to take away some of Atari's market share. That's a vague breakdown of how consoles work, but with computers, you 
didn't really have that option, you had to have the third party on board because there was already a pretty strong market for third party support back in the late 70s, early 80s. And from reading this, it sort of seemed like Atari's management, which I'm just going to be honest, Atari's management was crap after they forced out Bushnell. It was just, it was, Atari was horribly mismanaged. And it really showed as it built up, as you look at like the history of Atari and it all builds up to the video game crash and everything just went to hell. Same thing with the computers. They really, the people working on the computer lives really had to try to get Atari management on board with allowing third-party programs onto the computer and they did it successfully they they did actually manage to do that but it just seemed like they never were able to like get over the hump kind of like the Commodore 64 did and the Apple II did and also IBM as well Atari never was really able to do that it has their computers have like a pretty good following and everything, but they never really seem to push their way forward, at least here in the U.S. From I, I know I'm looking back on it in like a weird way, but it just sort of seems like I had never heard of an Atari growing up, and that kind of means maybe they didn't really take off that well, at least not in the area that I was I was growing up in. And granted, that's just a small slice of America, but that's just kind of the way I, I look at it. So, Jamie goes on and sort of explains the successors to the 400 and the 800. He talks about the, um, the 1200XL, I believe, and then the 600XL and the 800XL. And this is kind of where I want to say Atari's naming conventions for their computers was just god-awful. It, it is incredibly confusing. Sometimes they repeat numbers. The peripherals will have a weird numbering system as well. And me just looking at it, it's like, oh my god, all this hardware came out within like the span of, I believe it was about 10 years, like six to 10 years. And I just never, I, I just don't think it really like caught on in the way that would actually have warranted them releasing more and more of these. And that was kind of Atari's MO for a while. They were just sort of throwing good money after bad to make something stick after the video game crash. Because uh, after that, basically 84, the company got broke up. It might have happened in late 83, but definitely by 84. The company got broke up. You had the home consoles and computers, went to Jack Trammell. You had the arcades, uh, the arcades and basically all the software and the games and everything. That ended up going to Namco, and then Namco sold their stuff off and it became, uh, base game, it became Atari Games, and they would release Tengen games on the NES. Atari computers kept going, and they would release more products all the way up until, I believe, uh, the Jaguar was done, like, mid-90s or so was when they finally were totally over. That was when Atari was down to, like, one guy who was just handling, like, the licensing of the Atari name. But it, it's it's a very long and, and weird story for Atari, where they just... Their high was super high, and their low was, like, barely functioning as a company. And he does go into some of that in this because you can see a lot more of the mismanagement with Atari through their computer line. Their console line, it was sort of like, okay, so the 2600 is really good. We put out the, 52, the 5200 and that was... Uh, Jamie has, has a higher opinion of it than I do because I'm, again, looking at it through like the criticism from years later. I would say it really wasn't that great because they didn't really go all in on it. And then they just initially just gave up with the 7800 only to release it like a few years after it probably should have been put out. And they just never, they could never get the support for the 28, for the 7800, sorry. And yeah, it, this the book kind of covers a lot of that history and whatnot. Um, 
that's like the first half of the not even the first half that's like the first third of the book and then the next third of it I don't really like because it's a lot of the software and the games that were on uh, the uh, Atari computers over the years so Atari relied a lot on ports of popular games over the years mostly because uh, they weren't really producing a lot of like new software for it or mostly new games they would they would do new software but that was more of the stuff that was uh, meant to make the computer function as like a business computer or as a tool the games were mostly just ports of their arcade titles and they might have done like a few original games for it but I haven't seen anything that was really done I didn't see any of the in the game descriptions here I didn't see any like super original titles I haven't seen before out of Atari but they were getting ports from popular games at the time the problem with that was they were getting ports like a year later like six months to a year later so a game would come out on the Commodore 64 or come out on the Apple II and then like six months to a year later Atari users will get it. You can see why that might be a bit of a problem even back then where it would be like well, why the hell would I get this machine if the games that I want and mostly thinking from a from a kid to a teenager's perspective if all the games that I want are over on this machine why would I get Atari's machine? It it's kinda creates a bit of a problem there and yeah it's a little weird but um, going back to what I, and this is the part that I don't really like about it, is when we get into talking about the games. Uh, and this is where I'm unfortunately going to compare this to Jamie's previous book, Adventure, where he would throw in a lot of descriptions of games and almost kind of like reviews. I think I called them reviews before. These aren't reviews, these are more descriptions. Uh, but he used to have the games at the end of each chapter and it kind of worked, but there were just too many of them for my taste. Uh, it was, it was uh, more of a chronological story of the 2600 with this first book, where the games kind of helped to cement, okay, so this happened during this year of the Atari 2600, and these are kind of the games that went out with it. This doesn't do that. <laughs> this gives you over 100 pages of game. Excuse me. This gives you over a hundred pages of games, and it's just, it's like an overload. I, I'm i not sure why it's there, to be honest with you. Uh, the way it probably should have been done, and this is just the way I would do it, I would have had like specific software titles where you could say, okay, this moved the Atari or, uh, computers forward at this point. Uh, this was kind of an iconic game that came out on it. This was sort of like a really popular game that you could have and that sort of thing like just hit some of the more iconic games or sort of like the iconic software that came out to make these computers stand out from the crowd. And that's probably the major issue with this is they didn't do that. And that might be why Jamie did it. I might be reading into it a little bit too much. But that's just kind of my thinking behind it, because there's so many descriptions of games in here, and it's just like, oh my god, you took up a little over a third of the book with these game descriptions, and I don't know why. Uh, that's my major problem with this. Uh, after the game descriptions, it's fine, because he goes into talking about the best way to play these sort of games now, and sort of see how the 400, the 800, the... 1200 and eventually the 1600 and also the 1400 sort of see how those computer systems kind of changed over the years because you can go and you get emulators and you can see all these he calls emulation a gray area and it's not it's uh, unfortunately it's not you you can't um, profit off the ROMs the emulators are relatively fine but you can download the ROMs but you can't profit off of their sale like like uh, so if I traded a ROM with a friend that would be fine I couldn't charge him like five dollars for it because that that's going into software piracy at that point 
I would argue most of the ROMs online are moving into software piracy, but that's that's when it goes into like splitting hairs. It's more of a moral argument than anything else. Anyway, it, he talks about the emulation on it, which is great. He then talks about sort of the community around the Atari computers, which is fairly cool as well. But it just kind of, at that point in the book, you're at like the 200 page mark and it kind of feels like the book's running out of steam a little bit. Uh, that being said, I think this book would be more of like a resource for somebody. Like if you had a project on uh, Atari computers or on other types of computers, this would be a good book to kind of pick up and you could thumb through it, find the information that you want and move on from there. Or if you're looking for um, like games that were on the Atari computers or like a game to try from the from an Atari computer, then you could go here, thumb through it, find the game that you're looking for or something like that and you can move on from there. As a casual read, it's fine up until you get to those up to, up to the game descriptions, and I'm sorry for harping on that, but it's just that's where the that, that's where the book just like slows right down for me. And yeah, really sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, that's pretty much the this book. Um, I've already started the next one for the next book review. That's probably going to take me a little bit longer because it's less of a casual read and it's almost more like a textbook or something like that. Um, that one is called Metagaming. It's a weird one and I hope you guys are going to like it. I hope I'm going to like it because I'm the one that's reading it. Anyway, I'll talk to you all later and if you guys have any books that you want to recommend for me to review, just leave them in the comments below. If you like the video, please let me know. If you hated it, definitely let me know. Anyway, I'll talk to you all later, and have a great day.